club root and really got that baby going and drive up into the Skagit and see fields of cabbages and realize what must go into that effort, um, you'd have a, a much better appreciation of what it takes. Um, I just want to say something about the many activities that have been sponsored by Seattle Tilt in the past 10 years so you get an, a sense of the scope of the organization. We've been putting on an edible landscape plant sale for the last five years, and it probably was bigger than ever, held right here on this site last this, this spring. Um, we've sponsored uh, three years of a very successful master composting program, and the demonstration site is right behind you. We've put on a one-year demonstration of cold frames and cloches for the National Center for Appropriate Technology. We've conducted intensive urban agriculture education for one year under a grant from the uh, U.S. Department of Energy. We've uh, presented a three-day conference on urban ecology, and by the way, we see our work moving more and more in that direction. We're concerned with the garden, and we're concerned with the garden as a part of the ecology of the city. It's a real important link that we're going to be trying to make more and more in the future. We've put on hundreds of workshops on all aspects of urban food production, and for the last eight years, we've successfully been demonstrating techniques for urban food production in this garden. So we've been doing a lot of things. We're proud of it. We feel like it's a real uh, flower in the city that stands up right here. Um, our commitment has been to positive and productive alternatives to less thoughtful use of land. <coughs> now page two. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way I can do this. You're doing great. <laughs> I'd like to relate a couple of uh, one high moment and one low moment in the history of this garden. In 1979, about this time, after uh, digging and picking away at some really rough soil right on the edge here, right on the edge of what was then asphalt, we planted our first winter garden. And one morning we came out here to find that winter garden completely gone. Uh, every plant had been picked out of it, and we later found out that it appeared in plastic bags on the desk of Walt Hunley, the, the uh, head of the garden department. And someone felt that this garden was um, ripping off land that could have been used for a kid's play area. That was the low moment. At that point, we thought, well, maybe we ought to hang it up. That <laughs> was our first garden, and it was gone. The high moment was probably when we had the mayor here in 1985 cut a ribbon for this backyard composting demonstration site. <coughs> and we became a part of Seattle's very successful effort to deal with its, um, its waste management situation. It was a real part of being a part of that effort. And we feel like we're going to be doing a lot more with the city in uh, promoting some more enlightened ways of managing waste. So those are high and low points, and um, there's so many people here that have done really fine things to uh, help this garden manifest that I'm want, not going to try and name everyone. We've invited five people here to plant trees on this occasion, and um, those people are Virginia Galley from the Seattle City Council. and. Virginia has served on the Good Shepherd Center uh, board for <coughs> in between city hall <laughs> and has been a real successful advocate for the Good Shepherd Center and for Seattle Till. We've invited Ken Jacobson, Ken, <laughs> who uh, in the in the state uh, House of Representatives has been the sponsor of some. Uh, Successful urban, uh, <coughs> not urban, uh, organic food uh, <coughs> certification legislation. And Ken will say a couple words about that. And we've invited Jerry Clark, where are you, Jerry? Jerry, hi. <laughs> who is our uh, new city arborist and who is the man who is responsible.
responsible for seeing more trees planted here in Seattle. In addition, two very key people in Silt are here to plant trees. One is Elaine Stannard, who basically had the idea for the Silt Association back in 1977. Uh, and uh, she was pattern. <laughs> Good idea. Good. end of the garden, and we're going to plant one over at that end of the garden. This is going to be a cherry tree, and that's going to be a persimmon, and then Mark and Elaine are going to plant an apple that's been grafted from uh, where Mark grew up, down in the center of the garden. So, without further ado, let's make a path for the tree planters. Ken's right. putting in some organic soil amendment, yeah. symbolic <laughs> of organic legislation. Keep turning it or? Yeah, stir it up. Okay. Stir it up. <laughs> no problem. I'm going to get some work out of you guys. Yeah. That's why I'm in the legislature to get out of manual labor. <laughs> the organic legislation well, down there. One of the yeah. wheat farmers stood up and he wasn't much into it, but he said if things didn't get better, he'd probably be into organic farming. <laughs> so he's going to support the bill. <laughs> How's that? Of the, of the engineering department's um, continual efforts to assure the fact that Seattle is going to have street trees on our planting strip areas. And the purpose of this uh, poster sale is to encourage um, the planting of trees and that all the proceeds from the sales will be used to purchase trees and then we will then in turn offer the trees to community organizations, to tilt, to other organizations to, um, to get out and plant trees. So Carl? Let me present this to you. All right. So as everybody knows, the appropriate way to take a tree out of a pot is not to pull it by the stem or the trunk, but tip it upside down, hang on to the root ball, get rid of the pot real quickly, and lay it down nicely. Well, let's see. We probably want to we do that again. <laughs> yeah. The camera didn't get that. By the way, it's a little high. Yep. Tickle the roots off. Take some of the soil out. Take some of the soil out. out. <laughs> we got about 70 chef here. Well, the bed might be high. Good stuff yet, too. I only wish that uh, most of our planting strips soil was like this. <laughs> They're from my office. If you give me a call, you want to try an hour? Yeah. Why don't you have some out here? Yeah, we can sell. 
That'd be great. I'll do that. Yeah. And of course, you also want to score the rip ball. To loosen up the root structure. <laughs> no. Is that okay? Sure. Anyone? That's great. Great. Then we just start backfilling. When do we Ken? add the worms? Yeah. Worms will be, uh, you can add those right now. Where are they? Right here. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. oh come on. Put them on. Yeah. 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 From the compost project. All right. Yeah. is going to have a few words here about uh, organic legislation and more. Okay. Well, I guess the first thing when I come down here, I'm sort of envious when I look around and there's how beautiful it is, and I wish I had more time to put into my garden. And then the second thing is I fancy myself somewhat of a gardener, but you realize when you spend most of your time in front of this familiar group of plants and they're all in the weed patch that obviously you need to, really <laughs> <laughs> you need to do more work at home. And the, the only other thing I'll say is there's, uh, I got two more things. So one, when I was a freshman in university, I was required to read Candide. I never did really understand the last line. But now that I'm over 40 and served six years in the legislature, when Pangloss asked Candide, it urges him to consider another adventure. And he says, let's each tend to our own garden. <laughs> I do appreciate that line now. But the other thing, and I did want to say a little bit about organic agriculture, our labeling bill, 
And I understand now with the certification process, it's one of the best in the country. And I'm sort of glad Terry West is here, because if there's anybody that was responsible for the bill, it was Terry, because she contacted me and urged me to consider that type of legislation. And after some discussion, we decided to do it, and we took it to Olympia. And the first year I put the bill in, and everybody down there thought, what a strange piece of legislation. And I couldn't even get it out of the House Agricultural Committee. So the next year when I went back down there, I joined the House Agricultural Committee, and <laughs> that's one of the secrets of the legislature. If you want a bill out of a committee, get on that committee, and the chairman's more likely to move your bill. So by the second year, I got it out of the House and got it over in the Senate, and I was down there with Don Norman from PCC, and I was testifying on the bill before Senator Tub Hansen, and they started asking, well, you know, what's happening on this bill? And I said, well, you know, it's and they described the whole thing. They're looking at it sort of strange. And I mentioned, by the way, that there were 16,000 households in the 46th district that shopped at PCC and bought organic <laughs> commodities. And he started listening a little bit. Then Don Norm Norman corrected me. I said 16,000 members. He said, no, 16,000 households. And then all the senators said, now I know why you want the bill. <laughs> And we, we passed it, and since then we've actually improved the bill, so I think it's one of the best in the country right now. And the kind of thing I urge you to consider then for the future is to keep building on that and look at coming back with some more legislation so we can keep pushing the frontier. The other thing that's happened, in it, whether it's this or recycling, I can't believe what, how much change there's been in the last year in this whole area. Um, it's, it's a whole sea change. And things are, you were on the cutting edge before, and now uh, things are racing way ahead, and you're going to be vindicated, and you were right on these issues. And that's, thank you. persimmon right here side. on this mountain and we want to have a dish so that we don't have uh, more dip. drought problems. So, yeah, why don't we put a dish down? It's a great idea. Okay. It's got to go deep too, right? Yeah. Let's get Candy going here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's got more expertise than I do. Yeah. <laughs> go for it. Here. Here's another. Does anybody here know of any other oriental persimmon bearing and running? Some other bearing. They have the American well, persimmon, okay. John Ritt House. Right. Do yeah. they have any other Oriel systems? <laughs> <laughs> there's, one in, uh, there's one in South Park also. Right. Yeah, I'm I'm real familiar with the fruit when I first I Yeah. 
to organize the, to sponsor the Northwest Conference on Alternative Agriculture, which was held in Ellensburg in 1974, 14 years ago. Uh, we were sitting on the back porch of a homestead outside of Palouse, Washington, in southeast Washington, and, and, and we were talking about all different names, and Woody Derrick suggested, how about the Coalition for Alternative and Sustainable Agriculture? <laughs> and his wife kind of thought for a second, and she said, how about tilt? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, tilt stuck. Uh, and we went to the dictionary and looked it up. The word, it comes from the source, it's the same source as the word to till, to cultivate. And to cultivate, of course, is the, the source of the word culture. And, and agriculture, earth culture, and earth-based culture is what tilt is all about. And I think I got my first feeling for sustainable agriculture growing up in Stellicum sitting in the branches of my favorite Gravenstein tree, looking out over uh, southern Puget Sound and picking the apples, of course, much too green, and <laughs> eating everyone I could eat. And uh, last fall, I went back to my home. I turned 40 last fall. I went and climbed up in my apple tree, took Woo! some science from the tree. My friends up at Clown Mountain Farm grafted it onto the, this rootstock. So this is a graft from that tree that I grew up in. And, and to me, too, it's kind of symbolic in terms of continuity, tradition, grafting, and succession. Well, I don't know how old the genetics of Gravenstein are, but this is an ancient, ancient, ancient tree. And that, too, is a lot of what tilt is about and what agriculture is about. Wendell Berry said that, uh, no, was it Wendell Berry? I'm not sure who it was. It said, young people plant annuals, old people plant perennials. They plant trees. <laughs> and, uh, Gee, does that count me too? I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. so that's what this tree is all about. Well, my dad Any? said life begins at 40. Oh, good. Yeah. 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 Just starting work. <laughs> so Elaine is going to help me plant this tree, yeah. and it would certainly get in there. Get on the other side, Elaine. Oh, yeah. It's not getting too deep. It is too deep. It was certainly Elaine coming back from a conference in Switzerland, was it? Yeah. Uh, I International thought. Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements in yeah. Switzerland, and I'm not quite sure how it was you called me up, but said, hey, Mark, we've got to do this here. <laughs> so, give me any suggestions. One, one second, Mark. Uh, open, we're gonna get, you think this has plenty of rock fodders? Yeah, already? you're right, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. We're not going to put the rock fodders in this bed because it's been getting rock fodders for the last eight how years. How about water and worms? <laughs> Worms. There's plenty of worms there. Yeah, <laughs> plenty of worms. I bought a gallon <laughs> container of worms gill from the bucket. <laughs> so I'm open, totally open to suggestions. <laughs> Maybe open up the root ball? Yeah, yeah. I was scratching on those yeah. bottom roots. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Massage. Okay. okay. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> Any other? What's the weed you're planting there? Beaver few. Right. <laughs> you know me and weeds. <laughs> Okay. Bravo, bravo. Oh, yeah. 
Foundation in England and see some of their experimental work. And always remember that here in the Pacific Northwest, our bioregion is similar to Northern Europe. The gardens in England, the gardens in Denmark, Holland, all of that area are very similar to ours, much more similar than the rest of our own country. So it's, a, it's an interesting kind of international aspect of what we're doing. And I think one of the uh, big pushes in TILT has always been to recognize this uh, affinity to this other bioregion in the world and to get materials from there. And uh, our first publication on winter gardening was based uh, in great measure on the things that Binda had learned from English gardening. So that's my little okay, thing. Put some okay. worm castings in there. Oh, yeah, there's lots of worms in here. Happy, happy worms. Beautiful. Okay. So can we have some water? Water. 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 Coming. This one's ready. Can I share with you something I read this week? It said, tilt is to the soil what health is to the body. All right. Right. Exactly. Right. No, we're not getting any yet. Dry and get anything out. There you go. There we go. It's only fresh. That's fresh. Supposed to be for the brain, too. Wow. Yeah, it's only fresh. That's only fresh. That's only fresh. That's only It says on the brochure, and the case, when we looked it up in the dictionary, the word till. That's the structure and quality of soil. Yeah, it's a descriptive word of the state of the soil. And it Look also at this soil. Yeah. <laughs> described <laughs> the cultivation of wisdom in the spirit. Okay, that's good enough. We cut the water. Actually, uh, we should probably keep the water the rain only went down. We got a tree well, all the soil. Oh boy. Okay, I think we're done. Yes? Yes. Hey, yes. let's eat! Yeah. Let's eat! Yeah. You know, you guys just make me jealous.
compost. Mm -hmm. Warm compost. This is a picture of when Seattle Tilt was first started. When the land was cleared, you'll notice the rubble in the background. This is the edge of the asphalt paving in the back here. This all used to be a playground, and all the soil was uh, pretty barren and uh, unworked. And all the soil had to be moved, dug up, added to organic matter. And now we have beautiful soils out here. Uh, this is a shot of the entrance back when we uh, were doing the National Appropriate Technology Grant for the greenhouse, you can see all the plants growing up on the inside of the greenhouse, and uh, that you notice we don't have a path there like we do today. And uh, we also had uh, in this kiosk area a uh, map which showed all the different beds and what was being grown in them, and we're starting to do that uh, again uh, now that the garden has a garden coordinator. Our garden coordinators are uh, people who come, uh, come to the garden and work for very little pay, but to help coordinate our volunteers and help teach them by doing. And our volunteers are uh, sporadic and very, uh, very interested in learning here. And we try to keep them uh, involved and informed. Here you're seeing a picture of the greenhouse af just after we had finished the uh, garden path, which goes down the center. And the garden path was built by Ted Jessen. Uh, he's a local artist who uh, likes doing sculpture and, and more organic aspects of the fields. This is supposed to reflect a stream, a river stream going down the middle of, uh, of the garden. And the river rock was brought from the Skykomish River, and the bricks were found in the very attic of the Good Shepherd Center. It was uh, fun throwing them out at the top floor. <laughs> we try to plant trees. Um, we, our, our folks here are very dedicated to getting a permaculture um, planting here in the garden, but moving away from just annuals, more into perennials. As you can see here, we're situated right next to the Good Shepherd Center, which is a community center here in uh, North Seattle, which houses uh, such organizations as the Wallingford Senior Center, the Gray Panthers, a, uh, the Perkins School, uh, Greenpeace, and uh, Seattle Tilt and Art School. All of these are very active, so we're right in the backyard of the very active area. And we have a little outhouse back here where you're taking this picture now. Um, part of the permaculture setting is to also get functional uses of things which are um, uh, growing and providing a useful uh, purpose. This is a hedge that's alongside the garden path, and the apples are trained into a fence, and it's called cordon because we're training them along a cord to be a nice, tight, compact uh, hedge that bears fruit. And this is just an overview of the garden, and it's a wonderful place to be. Thank you, Jeff Gage. Sure, anytime. Okay. Hi, little guy. Mm. Abandoned child. Abandoned. Abandoned in the compost bin. Yeah. Tell him about it. Do you want some? Oh, Pancho. Oh. 
Oh, we want to be asleep tomorrow. Oh, where's the bot? <laughs> this is, I am the bot. <laughs> One of two. Oh, One of two. Okay. I won't be able to see anything. This picture shows our cold frames and some of our winter garden, our uh, winter gardening techniques. We cover these with plastic. We uh, have been do doing extensive varietal uh, research on um, brassicas at Phil. Uh, we have o well over 20 varieties of apples out in the out in the garden, and we can see how disease resistant they are and how well they work in our environment. This is amaranth. It's a uh, grain that's used by Indians and it grows very well here in the Northwest. Doing structural uh, things with beans and making little houses for kids. This is a, actually a kid's play area that's uh, surrounded by uh, garden beans. And doing edible flowers is something we're very much interested in, showing folks how they can add flowers to um, salads to make them much more enticing and, and wonderful. Um, just doing tiny little miniature gardens with uh, herbs and annuals, trying to uh, show detail. This is one of our uh, first approaches to uh, doing mini gardens in the garden. Uh, again, some just flowers as, as part of attracting bees and uh, other pollinating uh, creatures to our, to our uh, fruits and vegetables. And then creative structures for handling cucumbers and squash. And of course, a gorgeous rhubarb. What do we have up here? Uh, this is showing more of what we do as education. Our, our real challenge is to reach people and help communicate any skill that our members might have with others who don't have that skill. We have uh, planting up, potting up parties at our uh, edible plant cell where people learn how to propagate plants. Uh, we have, and here you can see some of the fruits of their efforts, um, and we use this money to then further doing educational work for Seattle Tilt, doing our newsletter and outreach. Um, here is showing uh, the, the plants in the greenhouse and just testing this kind of a greenhouse in the northwest we found that this greenhouse which is really designed for California didn't work so well in the northwest. You need more of a greenhouse which has full sun because of the lack of uh, sun during some of the growing periods. And part of our education is doing our edible plant sale showing that uh, edible plants are as beautiful as anything else and we solely do edible plants, flowers and uh, and uh, trees at the sale, and we're, we've ha finished our fifth one. Each year it gets bigger and bigger. Now over here, part of the education was actually building that greenhouse, and uh, it was really an, an incredible deal. This was meant to be at first a caretaker shack, but the caretaker shack was burned down before it was put in place, so we got a grant from National Appropriate Technology to uh, put this greenhouse together. Uh, here is uh, Arthur Lee Jacobson showing off his weed plot. We even uh, plant weeds on purpose and tell people what they are, what their names are, what they can be used for. We try to help them, educate them about what a weed is and how it's not necessarily a bad plant, it's just a plant that might not be in the right place doing the right thing for you. For you. Uh, showing the preserves in our harvest festivals, uh, of which this is a partial harvest festival. We do pruning classes in the fall winter and here we just do weeding. <laughs> weeding is just a great chore and it's also a learning experience. Some people don't know what plants to pull and what plants to keep and uh, that's useful. Beekeeping. Um, well, that's interesting. That's very interesting. We haven't done a beekeeping class now for three years but uh, that's useful to, to find out how to cultivate bees and right now uh, bees are an endangered uh, commodity. Um, and they really do need some more knowledge and understanding and acceptance by people. Um, the uh, apple pressing, that's part of teaching kids that, hey, these trees produce something that you can have right away. Instant gratification is what we try to teach here for kids and what the apple cider is. And, uh, of course, just, just uh, preparing the soils and how to get good till going in your own garden. And uh, after 10 years of hard work, we've done uh, some amazing things with the soil here. I encourage you to take a shot of yeah. out there in the garden and see what you've grown. We'll do that. Thank you. <laughs>
did you get? That's a fig tree. It's a fig tree. You gotta have a fig tree. That's a beautiful one. It makes me healthy. Nancy. Yeah, very good. Excuse me. Mama Vini. <laughs> Huge one. on those boards, George, where the other education things are. So he's going to do his slides, though. It's already rolled. Wow. Yeah, and there are only 10 bad ones. 10 bad slides. Well, then they're dismissed. I, I showed a bunch last no night to uh, all of the people. I, it's fun, because I get through about five rolls of showing. Lettuce. Uh, what does it taste like? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a red leaf lettuce. It's not uh -huh. real different in flavor. Oh, so it's, it's just like red leaf lettuce. It's just healthier than the normal one I see. Eight 
Okay. It's a real frilly variety. Yeah. Okay, let me get one of those. Okay. And the broccoli I got. And Stay away, could you, Virginia? All right, thanks a lot. Give you a call. Seed coat of corn is a very good material. It's baking powder, coffee powder, but also you can use this material. It really brings out the color and makes it a lot more spectacular. Steaming vegetables in it. It's really good. Better with broccoli. It's really nice and simple and green. You got that. Six ears. So you got uh, you know, like the uh, cabbage well, stuff that you can use on. Well, actually, we got our cabbage from Farmer's Hustle. Yeah. Seven. And you can also and go to the six. We've got six dollars and eighty cents into it. Those are grown primarily out on the island.
On mine this year, I got some. You can see it through the skin. It's got kind of a black kind of you know, fungus. Excuse me, can I have your attention? Uh, what we're having today is a benefit being put on by the Pimiento Brothers, and these guys are donating all their time to give you all the musical uh, uh, relaxation you can get, and hope you appreciate them. Pay attention to them, it's all for free, and they're donating it to Tilt, so enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. 
Oh, sorry. You're right. Why did I say that? Your mom's like losing it, huh? They left from last fall. But they're dry. Now, do okay. they, they still turn into that crumbly compost? Sure. It's, it's, if they're dry and they've been uh, sitting around for a while, that makes them a real, real, real nice material. Well, I've saved about three big boxes full. Now, can I mix that with my grass yes, clippings? Yes, most definitely. And put any dirt in it at all? No, you don't need to put any dirt in it. Sure. Dirt slows the composting process down. Oh, it does? Yes. Oh, I'm really glad to know that. Okay, so... Um, and then you want to make sure that you have enough moisture in there. That if the grass and the leaves are old, you want to mix them and then add water too as well. Most of the grass is still um, full green. None of it's really dry. Yeah. But uh, the other thing is, I've always had whatever stuff I had out in the sun and I'm turning it off. Mm -hmm. And now I'm trying to keep this cover from the sun. Well, you can, but it'll take about a year to dry out. And then you've got those yeah, kind of see, this will take all that time, and then you don't want to get compost well, keep, going. And you've got, you know, the best thing for compost is leaves and grass. Oh, okay. Stockpile all your leaves this fall. Yeah. When you get all that grass in the springtime, the two together. Good they're great for uh, using as mulches. Like but you them. wouldn't put them in a compost? You can. But they, they tend to break yeah. down. down a lot longer oh. time period than uh, regular leaves. And these add a lot of um, acid to the soil and they're great for berries. Oh. This is a uh, currant or blueberries or strawberries, strawberries Ooh, that's good. or raspberries. Ooh, that's good. There's a lot of acidity oh. in here and they, they break down so slowly that the nutrients carry it so you can get some sort of a um, uh, you know mulching effect and you don't have any weeding going on yeah. as well. So you get both benefits out of the, oh, out of this, the, uh, out of the pine leaves. Rather than putting them in a pile where they take, they'll take longer than regular leaves, but you'll get more out of it if you have berries. You know? But they can be used in a compost pile. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, uh, this is probably the best way to use them if you have berries, because they'll put a lot of acidity in the soil mm -hmm. that cooks them. We also planted a bunch of evergreens in the front mm -hmm. house where we use the pine leaves for uh, mulching. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the pine needles are great. They're the best for the mulch, but you can use them as a compost too. They're great. Okay. I was afraid you would acidify <laughs> the soil too much and spoil it. <laughs> oh no, they, these guys can take the acidity. Uh, How about rhododendrons with the pine needles? They, they'll probably work okay. Uh, the, the pine needles tend to break down longer, so they give you that more that no uh, no weeding effect mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. But here, especially with the berries, they add acidity. Any other things we can help with? Yeah, they're a little, they take a little more ingenuity. Like I said, dry them out or chip them or bring them to the transfer station as a clean fill. One by Jeff with the Oh, yeah. That's a good dollar the car. Make sure you tell them it's clean fill. We do great. It'll go not to the landfill. Where is the winter uh, garden? Uh, it's in the uh, tilth office. It's right by the daycare center up on the ramp okay. there. It's pretty crowded. But, uh, oh, well said. Okay. Instead of upright. It's a way to reduce their strength so they don't put as much strength into growing into upward, the but they put more ah. of it into the apples. I got you. So by tilting it, you're weakening the tree, so to speak, and so that it puts more into the apples, and then you don't get this real height. I got you. So you can just pick them and use it as a uh, as a berm almost, as a fence. Yeah, yeah. It's a way to uh, okay. uh, espalier it, I guess is right. the proper thing.
This worm is in the red worm. And so is stationary window. It also gives you a fill it up in the top of the paper and then mix in there your food waste and put the worms right in there with it. And they'll <laughs> make it into compost after a certain amount of time. I have more tissue waste than I have yard waste. Yeah. See, that's my, me too. So, um, I have Can you put yard waste in? No. No, this is just for food waste. But this, it's a really easy way to do it. Uh -huh. If you have, if you like to build or not, you need to Well, it must have been maybe, when I look at this now, it looks like maybe it was even smaller than half that size. It was a, you know, one of these freezers that had. And, you know, I really don't blame it. And oh, you can it, overload them with too much food. Yeah, uh-huh. So that's why they need and bigger yeah, air. And then I had to get in the line. Oh, you need the plastic terrible. On, the plastic but, on the top. Yeah, but, the, the thing, but then if you have plastic on the top, then uh, it doesn't hear We need to worms, have the you need, holes on the bottom. To be air. So you have to have holes on the bottom. Yeah, I have mine up on, that's like that. Uh -huh. I have, there's holes in the bottom of that, but I have I it up see. on uh, cinder block so that some air can get underneath. I see. Uh -huh. and plus, every time you open it up, you're allowing some air. Yeah, yeah. If you're not such a great carpenter, you yeah. should also just allow it with the cracks in the tree. <laughs> but then, on the other hand, you have to keep it moist. So then you. Well, you I found that moist. that's. Uh, you don't really have to do that much for moisture. Oh, really? The moisture of the food and a black yeah. plastic on the top will hold it you in. Re you really, I mean, you think that this gets enough air because it seemed to, you know, it seemed to me that like she was saying, well, that it needed air, and yet she mentioned the black plastic too. But, right. But I had, but when I read the book, it seemed to me that my problem developed because it, uh, the food was rotting from. Anaero uh, anaerobic lack of air, and therefore it was rotting rather than being uh, eaten up and, and decomposing well, if from you have the a organism and the worms. Right. If you have a, a small unit, uh -huh. you don't, might not have enough surface area for the worms to feed on. Uh -huh. And then the food is just going to sit there for a long time and get anaerobic, uh -huh. as opposed to if it's more spread out, uh -huh. but not as deep. Like those are, yeah. then, the, then they can get at the food a little bit better. Uh -huh. and because, uh, actually, so it's not a function of the plastic, but it's uh -huh. more of the surface area. Surface area. Oh. Well, well, that makes sense.
all this stuff up before 